why don't we all bow our heads and let's play, pray for those uh, activities upcoming. And at the same time, let's pray for the balance of our time. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing all of us here today. I pray, O oh God, that uh, as you will speak to us, that you will just bless our time. I pray for all the activities that are upcoming, that you will continue to use it, Lord, to equip our people, to minister to our people, to encourage our people, and even use our people to expand your kingdom here in the vow. And so, Lord, we now lift them up to you, knowing that you will use it in your ways to reach out as many people as possible. So I pray for all the preparations that we are doing. I pray that, Lord, uh, indeed, uh, it will truly be a blessing for all of us as we go through our series called uh, God's Grand Story and also the conference uh, that we will be running for the women. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, opportunity to be able to bring as much people uh, to be connected to you through these uh, events that we are running these next few weeks. We thank you again. We ask also you, you bless our time. As we end uh, the book of Genesis, I pray that you will just speak to us again, Lord, especially those who are parents and families. As we close this uh, book, I pray that uh, we will learn from you, just as we have learned in the past. So, Lord, bless our time together. As you have blessed my preparation, I pray I will be able to deliver it with clarity, with power, and uh, so that people will be ministered to based on this message. Thank you again. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody say, Amen. So if you're here for the first time, we are studying the book of Genesis, and uh, we are ending uh, our study this Sunday, okay? So we are still looking at the, the life of Joseph, okay? Just a quick background, quick background, okay? To remember, because we're closing this book, so it's important that we understand, okay? The book of beginnings. Genesis is called the book of beginnings. Now, there are four <clears throat> great events in this book. Creation, fall, flood, and nations. Okay? Four great events. There are also four great people in this book. Okay? Uh, we are introduced to Abraham, and then his son Isaac, and Isaac's son who is Jacob, and we are now here uh, looking at the life of Joseph. Okay? So, four great events, four great people. And the theme, ladies and gentlemen, of this book is this, okay? We call that the triangle of blessing, okay? The purpose, the purpose of uh, this book is really uh, to bless us so that we will be a blessing to others. That happens when we include God in the equation, okay? If God is present, for example, your marriage, if God is present in your marriage, then God wants to bless you. But you need to believe in what God is saying and all of His promises. As you know the promises of God, as you believe in the promises of God, folks, the blessing can only happen if you will obey. Right? So if you believe in God and in His promises and you trust Him and you obey Him, then you will experience His blessing. Now, after you experience His blessing, you don't Hold on to that blessing. You need to be channels of God's blessing. Understand? So why don't we say this together? Bless to bless others. Bless to bless others. Okay? Now, as we close this series on the book of Genesis, this morning I want to discuss about legacy. Okay? Legacy. Now, how does the dictionary... Uh, define legacy. One definition is this. It is something such as property or money that is received from someone who has died. Okay? Have you experienced that? You've received a property, you receive money because somebody died. Okay? It happens usually in the family. When a parent dies, you know, the properties are divided among the children. Okay? I've experienced that because my dad already died. Okay? And therefore, by law, half of all the property must be divided among the children plus one part to the spouse that is uh, still alive. So we experience uh, receiving property or money because somebody has died. That's, uh, sometimes we call that inheritance, right? Another definition of legacy is something that happened in the past or that comes from someone in the past. 
So if something happened in a person's life and that something is passed on to you. That's also the meaning of legacy. Okay? So legacy. Now, legacy begins with this. Okay? It begins with a godly perspective. Why is that important? Because godly perspective, ladies and gentlemen, results to godly thinking. If you have the right perspective, you will have the right thinking. And, and a godly perspective results to godly thinking, and your godly thinking results to what? Godly choices. Okay? You make the right choices. You make godly choices. And because your choices are godly, the behavior, ladies and gentlemen, is also godly. Because we have this thinking that right thinking results to what? Right behavior. So if you have a godly thinking, it will result to godly behavior. So very important that we understand what godly perspective is. And if you have godly behavior, then therefore you have what? Godly legacy. Okay? It results to a godly legacy. So, based on all of this, plus the definition of uh, Webster, legacy, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Let's read this together. Go. Legacy is the sum total of our daily choices. Okay? One pastor uh, who is uh, ministering in Hawaii, I read one of his uh, books, said this. Our lives, our lives is composed or is the result of the choices that we make, right? So when you get married, you choose somebody, then it becomes part of your life, okay? So now, if life is the result of all the choices we make, and if legacy is the sum total of our daily choices, so legacy, ladies and gentlemen, involves what? Our lives, okay? So how we live our lives will impact the legacy that we will leave behind, okay? Let me give you a picture. I don't know if you know this lady, okay? And in, he, he's, she's not uh, probably during our time. Why? Because even in the things that she wears, shows that she lived in the past, okay? Her name is Susanna Wesley, Okay? Susanna Wesley. She's the mother of John Wesley. Do you know John Wesley? How many of you know John Wesley? Okay. You don't know them? Okay. Yeah. John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church. Okay. So if you go around the city, if you see a Methodist Church, he was the guy who founded the Methodist Church. And because of what he did, okay, because of what he did, he prevented, some, some historians were saying, he prevented a civil war in England, okay? Meaning, he impacted the world, okay? Why? Because of the influence of the mother, okay? And the mother, Susanna Wesley, taught her children about God, okay? Taught her children about God. So, there is an example of a godly legacy. Now, by the way, legacy is passed on consciously or unconsciously. Okay? And sometimes we pass on a bad legacy. Sometimes we pass on a godly legacy. Okay? I remember when I was still very small. I don't know if I've shared this with you guys, but in the family, we have one girl, only one girl. Six boys, one girl. And uh, our sister was the favorite of our parents because only one girl. And it is compounded by the fact that her birthday was December 31. December 31 is the New Year's Eve, right? So, and you know what happens during New Year's Eve? Party, and during the time firecrackers were not yet banned, okay? So there were firecrackers, there were party, and it's the birthday of my sister. So every December 31, we always have a party, okay? So my dad would invite his friends, and they would eat and drink, okay? And I remember vividly one time, so we were playing the firecrackers, and I think I wanted to go inside the house. As I entered the house, my dad called me and said, Bob, come here. So little boy, Bob, goes to the dad, and... And he introduces me to his friends, and he told his friends, this is my son, this is my third child, okay? He's Bob. And then he picks up the glass, glass, okay? 
picks up that glass, what he was drinking. I don't even know what that was. He said, try. So I tried it. It did not taste good. Okay. So I just gave it back to my dad. But what was my dad teaching me? What was my dad teaching me by doing that? He was starting to tell me, it is okay to what? To drink. Okay. So I grew up, high school, started drinking, college, started drinking. When I was working, continued drinking. As a matter of fact, my wife will tell me, you're not drinking anymore. You're already swimming in liquor. Okay? And it was compounded by the fact that I was hired by one of the biggest liquor company here in the Philippines. I was the vice president for manufacturing. So we were producing a lot, a lot, a lot of hard liquor. Okay? So that was the influence that one of the influences that my dad passed on to me, okay? But that is in the negative sense. I, I also uh, got from my dad, okay, an influence we were in. He was a hard worker, okay? And I'm a very hard worker, okay? And that was one of my strengths, okay? But sometimes our strength becomes our weakness, right? As I work hard, sometimes we neglect our spouse, right? So my spouse, my wife, Chris, would sometimes complain that you work so hard, okay? So... Those are some examples of legacy. Consciously or unconsciously, we pass on legacy to our children. Okay? And let me look at another uh, set of family. Okay? Let's look at the Duke family. The Duke family, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they traced 540 known descendants. You know the breakdown? This family had 400 physically self-wrecked Descendants, self wreck okay? 400. 310 professional paupers, okay? Imagine that, 310. 130 convicted criminals, okay? 60 habitual thieves. Seven murderers, okay? Amazing. If this is your family line, I think you should change your name, okay? <clears throat> and then uh, 20 learn a trade. Why? Because they were in, in prison. They did not study in college. They learned a trade because they were in prison. They were, that was part of the discipline. Okay? And then uh, let's look at the Edwards family. Okay? They have traced 1,394 known descendants of the Edwards family. 14 were college presidents. 100 professors. Okay? 100 ministers of the gospel or missionaries and Bible teachers. Okay? 100 lawyers, okay, 66 doctors, 30 judges, okay, 13 college presidents, 3 mayors, 3 governors, okay, 3 United States senators, 1 controller of the United States Treasury, okay, 1 vice president of the United States, and many authors. Folks, what's the difference? What can we learn about legacy? Legacy, you can pass on bad legacy, like the Duke family. But you can also pass on what? Godly legacy based on the Edwards family. So let me ask you a question. What do you think of when you think about your father or your mother? Give you a little time to just... Remember, if your father is dead, think about your father. If your father is still alive, think about what do you think when you think about your father or mother? Okay? If your children, you're here and your parents are with you, look at them. Now, if you're a parent, by the way, if you're a parent, okay, let me also ask you this question. At the end of your life, at the end of your life, what will your children think about you? Will you think about you as workaholic, alcoholic, drug addict, or, you know, he was a godly man. He influenced others in the ways of God. So, is this a wonderful question to think about? Yes, okay? So, the question now we would like to answer is this. What legacy will you leave behind? What legacy will you leave behind? So, our title for our message this morning is, Live a Godly Legacy. Tell that to your neighbor. Live a godly legacy. Okay? And let me define legacy again. Legacy is what? The sum total of your daily choices. Okay? 
So very important that you make godly choices starting today. If you have not done that in the past, I strongly suggest you make godly choices. Okay? So what I will do today is we will look at three people, the sons of Jacob. One is Reuben. Reuben is a bad example, so we will not copy him, okay? But we can learn about him so that we will be able to avoid the things that will not give us a godly legacy. The second character we'd like to look at is Judah, okay? He started as bad, but ended up well, okay? He started up bad, but ended up well. And of course, the last one, since we're studying the life of Joseph, we look at Joseph, who is a good example. Okay? So, are you ready? Okay, let's look at Reuben, the bad example. Okay? Now, what can we learn about Reuben? Reuben, this is the blessing of Israel to his son, Reuben. He said, Reuben, you are my firstborn. What does it mean when you're the firstborn? Sa Tagalog, ano yun? Panganay. In their culture, when you are the eldest, you get a double portion of the inheritance. And part of being a firstborn, you will be the new leader of the tribe or the family. Okay? That's a few of those uh, privileges if you are the firstborn. Okay? And so Israel describes Reuben as what? You are my firstborn, my might in the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Okay? So now... Before I look at uh, the next verse, you need to understand legacy is what again? Legacy is the sum total of our choices. Okay? Now, we also introduce this concept to all of you. We are free to choose, but we are not free to escape the consequence of those choices that we make. Okay? Have you made wrong choices? Choices in the past, folks, never think that you can escape, okay? So as we look at the life of Reuben, he made bad choices, okay? He was the firstborn, he was preeminent, he was supposed to be the leader of the tribe when Israel will pass away. But because he made wrong choices, wrong choices in life, there were consequences. Let's look at the consequence. And so Israel continues his blessing upon Reuben by saying, uncontrolled as water, Uncontrolled as water. Okay? Imagine now a flood. Okay? Water rushing in. Uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence. Okay? Because why? Why? Because you went up to your father's bed and then you defiled it. He slept with one of the maids. Okay? I don't know. I think, I think it's Bilha or one of the maids. No? Remember the... Jacob ha, had four wives, Rachel, Leah, Silpa, and Bilha. So Reuben slept with one of them. Okay? And so because of that bad choice that he made, there was a consequence. Okay? We are free to choose, but we are not free to escape the consequences from the choices. And so therefore... Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. The consequence, notice what happens. In 1 Chronicles 5 verse 1, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, what was the consequence? His birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. Okay? So he made bad choices, and because of those bad choices, it has consequences. So he left a, not a godly legacy, but what is what happened? He was not anymore what? Enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. Okay? So that's, Reuben, bad example. So therefore, what's the lesson? What's the lesson for us? First, do not copy him. Okay? Do not copy Reuben. Now, for us not to copy Reuben, make sure that you make godly choices. Okay? 
make sure that you make godly choices because if you don't make godly choices, what happens? You cannot escape the consequence of the choices that we make. Okay? Now, let's look at the second one. And I think most of us are in this uh, second example. Who is that? Judah. Okay? Judah started as bad, but ended up well. So, my question to you is this. Have you made bad choices in the past? That up to now, it is impacting your life. Okay? Have you made bad choices? But you know, can I, can I encourage all of you? Judah made bad choices. Okay? But... He started as bad, but ended up, well, in short, if you made bad choices in the past, there is still what? Hope. There is still hope that you can impact your future for the better. Okay? So, Judah, what can we learn about him? What were the bad choices that he made? Okay? So, number one, married a Canaanite woman. Okay? Married a Canaanite woman. So the influence of the neighboring uh, people impacted Judah. Second, slept with his daughter-in-law. Remember the story? When the daughter-in-law, the, the son of Judah died, okay? Their culture tells us that when, a, when the husband dies, the brother of the husband becomes the new husband of the daughter-in-law. But the problem was when the second son of Judah was given to the daughter-in-law, he died. Okay? Two times. The first and the second. And so, because the culture is the next in line is who? The third brother. But since the third brother was still young, Judah said to the daughter-in-law, we have to wait because he has to grow up first. But in his heart, I think we've learned that in the past, in his heart, he was not willing to give the third son, okay, to the daughter-in-law. Understand? Okay? So, because why? He is afraid that if he gives the third son to the daughter-in-law, he will again die. Okay? But the daughter-in-law knew that. There was a deception there. So, one day... When Judah went to his friend, okay, the daughter-in-law, what? Camouflage, okay? He dressed like a prostitute, okay? And went to where Judah was going. And you remember, uh, maybe Judah was lonely because the wife just passed away. So when Judah met this prostitute, Okay? He had relationship with her. And of course, being a prostitute, she demands what? Payment. What will you pay me? She said, I did not bring uh, money. Okay? Okay. So the daughter-in-law, disguised as a prostitute, told the father-in-law, Judah, okay, uh, leave me your staff. Right? Leave me your staff so that when you bring uh, the payment, I will return the Stuff, right? But the daughter-in-law did not wait anymore. She went back, dressed up again as the daughter-in-law. So when Judah came back to the place, he cannot find the prostitute. So he asked around, is there a prostitute here? So everybody said, there's no prostitute here. So instead of, you know, pursuing that, he decided not anymore because he might become a laughing stuck. Okay, so he went home and said, you know, I, I was honest, okay, I brought the payment, but the girl was not there, so I am remiss of my what? Responsibility. And so he went back home. What happened? You know the story, right? The daughter-in-law got pregnant. And so Judah was saying, this is sin, what? Requiring judgment, right? But the daughter-in-law said, you know, the father of the baby inside is the owner of this staff, right? Okay? And so when Judah saw that staff and it was his, what was his conclusion? He said, my daughter-in-law is more righteous than me. Okay? So, 
That is the bad choices that he made. Slept with his daughter-in-law. And remember, when Joseph was looking for the brothers, and you know the story, they wanted to kill Joseph, right? So, instead of killing him, Reuben said, let's just throw him into the pit. Okay? His intention was to save Joseph, right? But when Reuben was away, the Ishmaelites were coming, and you know, it's Judah who suggested to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelite traders. He said, well, let's make money out of our brother. Let's sell him to the traders. Okay? So that is another thing that he did. Okay? Bad choices. But you know what happened? When there was a famine in the land, they went back to Egypt to buy food. And Joseph, they did not know who Joseph was. He said, you know, leave me your brother Benjamin. Okay? And you can go back to your father. You know what he did? He said, my Lord, I will be slave forever. But this is my request. My, my father will die if my brother Benjamin will not come back to him. I will replace him. Okay? Make me a slave forever. There was a change in heart in Judah. Okay? So, from bad choices, he started to humble himself. He, he was now willing to sacrifice. Remember, he wanted to kill. They wanted to kill Joseph. Why? Because they were jealous of him. Because he was the favorite of their father. But this time, instead of being jealous, he was willing to give up his what? Life. Okay? And because of what he did, because of what he did. Notice, remember, Judah is an example of what? He began badly, but he ended what? Well. Now, by the way, how does God change us from this to this? Okay? How is transformation? Uh, how does God do that? Remember this process that we were saying, how God transforms? It is a process and it will result to a product. And God uses four things to transform us. Can you remember the four things? Number one, God's Word plus the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So, as you read scriptures, that's why I really encourage all of you, if, you know, we will be running this old, walk through the Old Testament, my challenge to you, please, go on vacation, okay? This is a good investment for you. Join us, okay? And, Please be with us in the series. Why? Because God's Word plus His Spirit can help transform us. Okay? Plus what? People. Sometimes God brings people that are what? Unreasonable. Sometimes people brings people who will encourage us and motivate us. So God uses people to transform us. Okay? Plus what? Circumstances. Sometimes he puts us in a circumstance that you have no choice but to just depend upon God. Okay? And sometimes he, you, he places us in a situation to show what is really inside us. Remember my toothpaste illustration? When there is pressure, what comes out? It's either garbage or toothpaste, right? So when circumstances is difficult, what comes out is the real you, okay? So, God allows circumstances in our life to change us. And then lastly, He allows time, okay? Remember, uh, Jacob spent 20 years under Laban, his father-in-law, okay? And sometimes time, God uses that, why? To mold us into what? Christ-likeness, okay? That's the process, okay? And that is what He did to... Judah, okay? So, folks, what can we learn about the life of Judah? Let's read this together. Go. Just because your beginning was not good does not mean your legacy will always end up bad. I know many of you have made bad choices in the past. Maybe for some of you have been unfaithful to your wife. Some of you might have been unfaithful to your husband. Some of you may, might have made a bad choice of maybe taking drugs, okay? And some of you uh, maybe, I don't know what you have done in the past, okay? Maybe you have made wrong investments that you lost your money, okay? But folks, just because your beginning was not good does not mean that your legacy will always end up bad. So my suggestion is this. 
Let us not focus in our beginning or our past, but rather, what? Focus on our future by making wise choices today. I always tell people, okay, you need to have a vision of the future. How do you see yourself in the future? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now. Why? Because if that picture of the future is very clear to you, all your choices today must bring you to that future. And if that choice that you will make today will bring you to that future, that is a wise choice or a wise decision. That's why in CCF, very clearly, we know our mission. We have to make Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers. We also know our vision. We have what we call the 2020 vision. Okay? 2020 vision. Why? In 2020, year 2020, we will have 20,000 small groups and 20,000 small group leaders. And we see in the future that we will have in each small group at least 10 people and therefore there will be 200,000 people in the small group. That is our vision. And therefore everything that we do today should bring us to that future that we want. Okay? So my challenge to you is this. Maybe you have made bad choices in the past. But if this is very clear to you, I'm going to pass on a godly legacy to my children and my grandchildren. Then therefore, ladies and gentlemen, all the choices that you will make starting today must bring you to that future. Understand? Because why? Legacy is what? The sum of all our choices that we make daily. Okay? So, Judah, this is the blessing of Jacob to his son Judah. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Okay? That was his blessing. And then verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. The word whelp there, if you look at the original language, is baby. It's meaning it's a cub, lion cub, a baby lion. Okay? From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him up. And then in verse 10, this is another blessing that uh, Israel is passing on to Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Scepter, okay? Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. In short, what Jacob is telling Judah is this. In your line, in your line, okay, there will be you, your, your descendants. In your line will be what? Kings and rulers. Okay? And he says, this will continue to happen until what? Until Shiloh comes. Okay? The word Shiloh in the Hebrew means to whom it belongs. Okay? So if I put that meaning in this passage, the scepter and the ruler's staff will remain in the line of Judah until the one will come to whom it belongs. Understand? And if that happens, then it will break the ruler, the line. Okay? Now, if you look at the book of Gen uh, Revelation, chapter 5, verse 5, notice what it says. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Why? Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah and the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Who is being described here in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5? Who is the lion of Judah? Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus comes, okay, when Jesus comes, then the rule, the the Rulership will stop. That's why the Jews were thinking, remember, when the Roman Empire took over Israel, the rulership stopped from the Jews and it went to the Romans. And so they were so bothered. They were so disturbed. Why? Because remember, God promised it will continue until what? The one who, it, the, that scepter, the one that, who should be holding that scepter must be alive. They did not know that 
Jesus was already alive. And so they were crying out, you know, the rulership has stopped from the Jews. It's now with what? With the Romans. But in reality, Jesus was already born. Okay? So it fulfilled the prophecy. Okay? And what happened? If you look at Joseph's family tree, this is Jacob, the father, and he has four wives, Leah, the maid, Shilpa, Bila, the maid of uh, Rachel. Okay? If you look, it traced the line of Judah. Okay? You find that in that line, you have King David, and in that line also who? Jesus Christ. Okay? So, folks, is it possible to start, begin bad, and end up well? Is it possible? Yes. As long as you allow God to transform you. Okay? Because who can change us? Who can change us? Only God. So, very important that you study God's Word. Very important that you have a godly perspective so that all the choices that you will make, ladies and gentlemen, are godly choices. Okay? And if you do that, you'll be able to pass on a godly legacy. So, Reuben, bad example. Judah started as bad, but ended up well. Okay? Ended up well. So, please do not look at your past. Learn from it, but do not dwell in your past. Don't look at your beginnings. Instead, look at your future. All the choices you will make today must bring you to the future where you want God to to bring you, okay? And then let's look at the life of Joseph, okay? So very quickly, Joseph is a what? Good example, okay? Let me ask you a question. What legacy enters your mind when you think about Joseph? We have been through this uh, life of Joseph for so many weeks now. If ever you will think about Joseph, what is the legacy that he passed on, okay? Give you a few moments to think about it. Okay? Or maybe whisper it to your neighbor. I think Joseph's legacy is this. Okay? What do you think? Maybe you'll be saying integrity. He was living a uh, life that is, you know, integrity. Or maybe you will say his legacy is perseverance. In spite of all the trials in his life, he persevered. Right? That's probably one. Maybe faithfulness. Okay? In all of this, he remains true. He remains faithful, okay? Those are probable, okay? But, okay, if you look at the life of Joseph, okay, let's extract what legacy he passed on to his children. Now, it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he's about to die. So what did he do? So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. Now, what can we learn? Now imagine, why will he bring his children to his dad? Right? So here we see a principle. Okay? Number one, to pass on a godly legacy, we need to be what? Intentional. Joseph was very intentional. When he heard that his father was about to die, he brought his two children. Okay? Why? Because he wants his children to listen to their grandfather. And if you read chapter 48, okay, 48, you will see that Jacob adopted the two sons. He said, these two sons will be mine. They will be like brothers of Simeon and Reuben and Levi. Okay? And that's why uh, he, being the grandfather, he adopted his, his two grandchildren. Okay? So, Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me here. So he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Okay? Jacob or Israel wants to bless his grandchildren. Okay? Verse 14. But what did he do? Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger. Okay? So what Joseph did was this. He brought his two children and the oldest he placed on the right of his dad and the youngest on the left. He was expecting that the dad would bless the older, the firstborn, by putting on the right hand. And then we'll bless the younger one by putting his left hand on the head. But that did not happen. What did Jacob do or Israel? But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim. Okay? Which is, who's the youngest? And then his left hand on Manasseh's 
head. Okay? So therefore, you now imagine what was Israel doing. Instead of doing that and this, what did he do? Cross. Okay? So crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. Now, let me ask you a question. Why did he do that? Why not bless the firstborn and then the second one, the younger one? I don't know. The Bible does not tell us. Okay? Maybe God spoke to him. He said, bless the younger and then next bless the older. Another possibility is this. Because he knew that the history. Remember Abraham? How many sons? Two. Isaac and Ismael. Who's the oldest? Ismael. Who was blessed? The younger. Isaac, right? Instead of Ismael. Now, how many sons does Isaac have? Two. What are the names? Esau and Jacob. Who's the oldest? Esau. Who's the youngest? Jacob. Who got the firstborn, the blessing? Of course, it is by deceit, right? So, the blessing for the firstborn went to the younger rather than the older. Now, how many sons does Jacob have? Twelve, right? Who's the oldest? Reuben. But because of the choices of Reuben, he did not receive the blessing from his dad. Instead, who got the blessing? Joseph. To whom was the blessing given? To Ephraim and Manasseh. Double portion. Understand? Because if you're the firstborn, you receive double portion. So the blessing was given to the two sons of Joseph. Now, if you look at the sons of Joseph, to whom was the blessing given? Not the older, but the younger. What is the lesson here? Some of you might be thinking, I am just ordinary. I'm not prominent. I'm not up there. I'm not even a, I'm not even a college graduate. The lesson here, ladies and gentlemen, is this. God is so amazing. He can work in and through you regardless of who you are. Never think you're ordinary. You might be really ordinary, but can God use you amazingly? Yes. We can see that here. Even the younger was given the blessing of the firstborn. So that's one lesson I can see here. Okay? So, he blessed Joseph and said, now, after blessing the two children of uh, Joseph, he now blesses Joseph. He said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walk, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. Now, let's break this down. He mentions God, okay? The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walk, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. This is the first occurrence of the word shepherd, that God is a shepherd, okay? Now, if you notice in this passage, there is a repeated word. It is my, my fathers and Abraham, and the God who has been my shepherd all of my life to this day. So, folks, godly legacy Ladies and gentlemen, begins with a personal encounter with God. You cannot, you and I cannot pass on a godly heritage if you have not personally encountered or experienced God. Understand? How can you pass on something which is not true in your life? Understand? So here we see that Jacob, is now telling his son Joseph that you need God. And he is my God. He is my shepherd. Okay? So you need to have a personal encounter with him if you want to see a future where you can pass on a godly heritage to your children. Okay? Verse 16. The angel was redeem me from all evil. He's not explaining how he has experienced God. By the way, the word redeem here is first occurrence also in the Bible. The angel was redeem me from all evil. Bless the lads. And may my name live on in them. And the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Okay. And then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die. Okay? Behold, I'm about to die. But, but God will be with you. 
and will bring you back to the land of your fathers. Second thing about passing on a godly heritage is this. By the way, this statement, but God, but God, is a proof of faith that Jacob was really trusting God. And he was telling his son Joseph, do the same. Folks, if you want to pass on a godly heritage, you need to be intentional, and at the same time, you need to walk by faith. What he is saying here is this. No matter, but God, he said, but God will be with you. As parents, you need to pass this on to your children. What do I mean? You need to tell your children this, okay? Whatever happens, when I am gone, whatever happens in your life, if you go through trials and problems and disappointment, God will always be with you. Trust Him. Understand? Trust Him. Trust His promises. But our problem is this. If we don't have a personal encounter with God, God might just be theoretical in your life. How will you know if God is theoretical in your life and, or if he's real in your life? You will know that God is theoretical in your life when you go through problems and you respond wrongly. Okay? If you continue to grumble, your children will listen to you and they will see that and say, why is my dad grumbling? Why is my mom worrying? I thought he has a big gun. I thought that God is a provider, that God will, will help us, that God will uh, guide us. How come they're complaining? That means, ladies and gentlemen, maybe your God is what? Theoretical. You might be here this Sunday, but when you face problems, you don't even consider God. Okay? So, you need to walk by faith. So, if ever you forget everything I say today, if you want to pass on a godly heritage, make sure that you teach your children and tell them to trust Him by faith that God will be with them no matter what. Understand? No matter what. If you are successful in teaching your children that, Ladies and gentlemen, you have passed on a godly legacy. Okay? Now, the question is this. How do we walk by faith? What are some indicators that you're walking by faith? Okay? So, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that which we did to him? They were so afraid. When <clears throat> Israel died, in their minds, oh, no. Oh, no. Joseph might, what? Get back at us. They were so afraid. Okay? So that's their, their situation. Verse 16. So what did they do? They sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now, please forgive the transgression. Now, if Israel wanted to pass on that message to Joseph, he could have done that, right? But I think here they tried to what? Present something which Israel did not say, but here you will see where they, did they acknowledge their sin? Did they acknowledge their guilt? I think so. Because if you read through this passage, it says, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers. I think this is coming from their heart. If we remove the father here, then it's like telling Joseph, Joseph, can you please forgive us? I, we beg you, we have transgressed you and sin against you, we have done you wrong. Understand? Here they were willing to admit their sin and guilt. Notice the response of Joseph. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Why? Because I believe, based on this statement, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Joseph realized that his brothers has finally, finally acknowledged their sin against him. Okay? But their fear was what? He might take what? Revenge. Because some of us, okay, if we don't make godly choices, 
and somebody hurts us, you know what goes through your mind? You probably say, ngayon, this is the time. I will what? I will take revenge, right? But walking by faith is not that. Because God says, you should not take vengeance. Why? Why? Because look at the next verse. His brothers also came and fell down before him. Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? What is Joseph saying? Am I in God's place? Why? When do we put ourselves in God's place? When do we do that? When somebody hurts us and you don't forgive that person, you're putting yourself in God's place. Why? Because God says, forgive just as I have forgiven you in Christ Jesus. So therefore, if you don't forgive, you are violating God's commands and you are putting yourself in God's place. When you tolerate sin and immorality in your family, you are putting yourself in God's place. Understand? And when you take vengeance, okay? When you take vengeance, you're also putting your place in God. Okay? Now, as for you, notice. By the way, when somebody hurts us, it does not mean we sweep it under the rug. We deal with it. And Joseph did not sweep it under the rug. He said, as for you, you meant evil against me. So he acknowledges that what they have done is wrong, but God meant it for good. Why? In order to bring about this present result to preserve many people. Notice his godly perspective. These trials, all of this that you have done to me is evil. But as Joseph looks at it from a godly perspective, he says, this happened, why? Because God was preserving many people alive. Understand? So if you go through difficulty and trials and problems and disappointment, don't look at it from your perspective, but look at it from God's perspective. Because if you see God's perspective in that situation, you will make godly choices. You will respond properly. And if you respond properly, your children will see that, and they will copy you, and they will see that, wow, my dad responds this way because he believes in what God is doing. Understand? And so that is what happens. Okay? So, walking by faith, ladies and gentlemen, is this. You need to believe that God can overcome evil. Meaning, whatever people will do to you, God can overcome that. You need to believe that. That is walking by faith. Lord, I don't understand what's happening to me, but I believe that you're going to do something and you will turn this out for good. Okay? Notice in Romans 8.28, what does it say? As for you, he says, we know, we know what? That God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. God is a God that will turn all things. When you say all things, even the bad things that happen in your life, God can what? Turn it for good. So, walking by faith. You need to understand that God can overcome evil. He can also turn it for good. Okay? Turn it for good. Verse 21. So, therefore, Joseph said to his brothers, Do not be afraid. I will provide for you, your little ones. So, he comforted and spoke kindly of them. Part of walking by faith is this. When somebody hurts you, what must you do? Forgive, right? Forgive. But it does not end there. You need to love the person. You need to what? Show kindness to them. Some of us, when somebody hurts us, we say, I've forgiven him, right? I've forgiven him. I've forgiven her. But when you see each other, you don't talk to, to that person. That's not walking by faith. Walking by faith is this. You forgive the person because God said so. Now when you meet the person, you should show love. You should show kindness. So that's what Joseph did. He told his brother, do not be afraid. Why? I will provide for you. I will take care of your little ones. Understand? That is called walking by faith. It is not taking revenge because in the mind of the brothers, oh no, our dad is dead. He might take what? Vengeance upon us. But Joseph said this. Am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? What he means was this. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is whose? God's, mine. 
I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, when he said, you know, if you're afraid that I will take vengeance upon you, I will not put myself in God's place. Why? Because it's only God who can take vengeance. I am not, I cannot do that. That is God's part. Okay? That is God's part. Therefore, what is our part? Our part is found in verse 21. Let's read. Go. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Understand? That is walking by faith. Lord, this person has hurt me. I forgive. As a matter of fact, I not only forgive, I will extend even kindness. Not only will I extend kindness, if he does evil to me, I will overcome that evil by doing good to that person. That is, ladies and gentlemen, walking by faith. Okay? Joseph's legacy. He was a man of faith. He finished well. He was faithful. There was integrity in his life. Young man, great impact, saved the nation of Egypt and even the surrounding nations. Okay? Greatest treasure. Was it money? No. Was it position? No. Was it property? No. What was his greatest treasure? It was God. It's all about God. Okay? He had faith in God. He lived by faith. He walked by faith. Okay? Why? That is the greatest legacy he is passing on to his children. Just like his dad, his dad said, proof of faith. What's the proof of faith? But God will be with you. Okay? That was Jacob to Joseph. But Joseph legacy is the same. Okay? He was a man of faith. Why? Look at Hebrews 11.22. How is he described? He's described this way. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, now he was now about to die, mentioned to, of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Now you probably say, huh? Bones? What about all of these bones? Why did he mention the bones? Okay? Because in Genesis 50, 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. What he was telling his brother was this. I'm about to die. Through Egypt is the most powerful country during the time. But what he was saying is this. Egypt is not our home. Our home is the promised land. So, so because Egypt is not our home and we have a land that God has promised, therefore, what did he do? He said, then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you and you shall carry my bones up from here. So even if he's dead, what he's saying is this, this is not our home. We will have a different home, which is what? The promised land. Understand? How do we apply that today? Can I tell you? Everybody, listen to me. This world is not our home. Because this is not our home, therefore, do not love the world. Understand? Because we have a home where? Where is our final destination? In heaven. And the danger for some of us is we are, what? Sucked in into the mold of the world. And Joseph was telling his brother, Egypt, even if it's so rich, even if it has everything that it can offer, it is not our home. Our home is the promised land. And that is also true for us. Our home is not in this earth. Our home is where? To be with God in heaven. Okay? Now, was that promise fulfilled? Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. Okay? And so what happened? Since Moses cannot go inside the promised land, who took over? Joshua. Notice what Joshua did. Joshua, as they entered the promised land, brought the bones of Joseph. They buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt. Imagine in their panic, 
So many millions of people, Israelites, as they were leaving Egypt. Somebody said, by the way, the bones of... By the way, the bones of Joseph. We might forget it, okay? So they had to bring the bones. Why? What's the lesson? Egypt is not their home. God promised the promised land. Same is true for us. The world is not our home. We have a better home, which is where? In heaven. Let me close with this story. A man, his assistant, bought the newspaper. Read the newspaper and said, Boss, your name is here. And so the boss said, What? <laughs> Can you read me what's in the news about me? He said, It's not the news, sir. It's your obituary. What? So, can you read the ob obituary? It reads like this. His name, and then his birthday, and the date, okay? And then it says, Merchant of Death. Merchant of Death. So, when he saw that, he said, wow. There was a mistake, of course, because he was still alive. But the fact that he read that obituary describing himself, the Merchant of Death, you know what he said? By the way, the guy, his name is Alfred Nobel. He was the inventor of dynamite. Okay? And dynamite was used in war, killing a lot of people. Right? Killing a lot of people. That's why he was described as what? The merchant of death. Okay? And this was his re reply to that obituary. Every man ought to have a chance to correct his obituary in midstream and write a new one. As people were describing him as the merchant of death, he said, since I'm still alive, I have the chance to what? To change it. You know how he changed it? He put up a foundation called the Nobel Peace Prize Award. Nobel Peace Prize. So, a lot of people are, have received those rewards because why? He did not want to be described as a merchant of death, but he wanted to be described as what? A person who propagated peace. Okay? So my question to you is this. If you were to write your obituary while you are still alive, okay? While you are still alive. If you have a piece of paper, write your name there, write your birthday on the next line, and then put a dash, dash, okay? My birthday is April. April 14, 1955, dash. Don't put, don't put the the date and month, date and year after that. Why? You don't even know when you will die, right? Okay? So just put that blank. And after that, write your obituary. How do you want to be remembered when you die? How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered like Nobel as a merchant of death? Or do you want to be remembered as one who was propagating peace? So my question to you this morning is this. Or this afternoon. What legacy will you leave? How, what will people say about you when you're dead? That is the legacy that you will be leaving behind. Let's all rise and close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray for everyone here today, these men and women, the families who are here today. Lord, you want all of us to leave a godly legacy, a legacy that will outlive our generation, a legacy that will even outlast our lifetime. And so, Lord, now I pray that we will have an eternal godly legacy, a life that is so significant and meaningful. Help us not to waste our life on earth, but help us to live with the future in mind. And that future is that we will be with you for eternity. 
And I pray for each and everyone here this, today. If there is anyone, Father, just like Judah, who needs to change, change them. If there is anyone here that they need to have a godly perspective and make godly choices and godly thinking so that they will have godly behavior, help them, O oh Lord, if they need to adapt to a new behavior. Lord, some of them might not have experienced you personally. Just like Israel or Jacob, he experienced you personally in his life. And so, Father, if there is anyone who has not done that, because we know, Father, that we cannot pass on something which we do not have. So if anyone here this morning does not have that personal experience and relationship with you, Father, I pray that you will just touch his heart and understand that what you did was you loved them so much, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for all of their sins. They, he was buried and he rose again from the dead. And you promise in Scripture that if we believe in Him, trust Him by faith, we will not perish but have eternal life. And Father, I pray that you just honor that commitment for those who in their heart prayed sincerely that prayer. And if you are that person today, then pray this just simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. On my own, I can never save myself. I cannot be with God because of all of my sins. But I believe 2,000 plus years ago you died for all of my sins. You were buried and you rose again from the dead. And I claim your promise that if I believe that by faith, I will experience forgiveness. And you will not only forgive my sins, but you will give me eternal life in Christ Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for rising from the dead. Thank you for forgiving my sins. And thank you for giving me eternal life. Father, I pray for each and every family represented here. I don't know what their struggles are. I don't know what the parents' problems are. But Father, I pray that this mo today, today, Father, you have spoken to them. We might have made bad choices in the past, but Lord, there is hope to change our future. Thank you, Father. Thank you for moving and transforming our lives. And I leave up to you each and every family here. Continue to shower them with your blessing. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.